Sometimes, the best scares come from the most unexpected places. When we're playing a horror game like Resident Evil, we're always on edge, expecting something spooky to come out at any moment. And while they do certainly scare the hell out of us, we already know they're coming. Now when they come from a cute and cuddly kids game, well, that's a different story. So today, we're going to take a look at some of the characters that brought out these horrifying moments in N64 games. And we're going to talk about one game per entry, because that's just fun. These are 7 unnecessarily horrifying characters in kid-friendly games. The Ghost of Wrinkly Kong from Donkey Kong 64 Wrinkly Kong is the kindly old gorilla who appeared throughout the Donkey Kong Country series. Unlike her husband Cranky Kong, she actually tries to help the Kongs out by offering them advice about the game's items and objects. Through her life, she was very caring and intelligent, being a faithful wife to Cranky and a possible grandmother or mother to Donkey Kong that's still a bit up in the air. Unfortunately, she passed away after the events of Donkey Kong Country 3. Throughout Donkey Kong 64, we are left with sad reminders of her life through these wrinkly doors that- Holy shit. Alright, so Wrinkly Kong does make an appearance in Donkey Kong 64 as a ghost. And while she assures you that she's not there to harm you and that you shouldn't be afraid, those bone-chilling sounds of her spirit coming forward were enough to make any child actively avoid every single wrinkly door they came across, no matter how helpful her advice was. It's almost a shame how freaky she is in the game, as she still is as sweet as she was in life, even being the only Kong in the game to offer her help for free. Despite being dead, Wrinkly Kong continues to make appearances in Donkey Kong games, even being featured as a playable character in DK King of Swing, DK Jungle Climber, and Donkey Kong Barrel Blast. Thankfully, without that hellish ghostly shriek. Clanker from Banjo-Kazooie Back in 1998, an instant classic was released in the form of Banjo-Kazooie. The worlds were fairly small, contained and cute, as seen in the first two worlds of Mumbo's Mountain and Treasure Trove Cove. When entering the third world for the first time, it seems to be the same case. You enter a small sewer system with some ugly crabs walking about, when suddenly you find yourself in an enormous body of water and you clearly aren't alone. You're greeted by a big pair of creepy eyes and an even bigger set of sharp teeth. This is Clanker, Gruntilda the Witch's garbage disposal system. Clanker is a tragic character that only becomes terrifying when you begin to realize what he truly is. While he may seem to be a completely mechanical fish shark thing, when you enter his body you find organic organs and bones inside. Just what exactly was Clanker before Gruntilda found him? He's completely submerged under sewer water when you first meet him, despite having to breathe through a blowhole, so it's clear that he's not being treated well. After helping Banjo find the rest of the jigsaw pieces in the area, he is never seen again, until about 10 years later in the 2008 title, Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts. In the level Banjo Land, which is a museum of every Banjo character from the first two games, Clanker makes an appearance here, cut up into many, many pieces and scattered throughout the level. Taking his organic interior into account, this becomes incredibly gruesome. He's still alive too, meaning that he has to live with this horror now. In some pre-release footage of the original Banjo-Kazooie, Clanker makes an appearance to be fully organic, so what happened to him? that turn him into this monstrosity. The god of this world is truly cruel to Clanker. Brain Andros from Star Fox 64 At the beginning of the Star Fox series, Dr. Andros was a simple, well-intentioned, and respected scientist. However, his lust for power turned him insane, and was eventually banished to the planet Venom where he began his conquest for the entire galaxy. Andros is the final boss of Star Fox 64, and playing through a normal route has you face his monstrous creepy monkey face in some drug-induced nightmare arena. Making it to the end of Venom has you facing Andros as normal, until you obliterate his face, revealing this disgusting abomination. The true final fight is with Andros's disembodied floating brain and retinas. 
It's one of the most disgusting final bosses in any Nintendo game, and it's incredibly unnerving seeing it move around, especially those retinas. It's sad just how far Andros has fallen from grace, going from a respected scientist to an eldritch abomination. And if that wasn't enough, they managed to make him look even more grotesque in the 3DS remake, Star Fox 64 3D. Luckily, Brain Andros is absent from the second remake, Star Fox Zero, instead being replaced by a metallic robot Andros. Although it feels a bit wrong to not have him around anymore, perhaps it's for the best that we don't see him in HD. The Killer Piano in Super Mario 64 Sometimes our assumptions can get the best of us. For example, assuming that there won't be anything horrifying in a series as playful and wholesome as Super Mario. We were all guilty of this before playing Super Mario 64. Never again now. When entering the level Big Boo's Hunt, the atmosphere is incredibly uneasy. One that feels almost out of place in a Mario game, but whatever, it's probably just a standard Mario ghost. Like Boo's and Dry Bones, right? Well... Meet the Killer Piano, infamous for making a generation of children shut their pants collectively. The seemingly normal piano becomes a musical greeting card from hell the second you get too close to it. Horrible jagged teeth protrude from it as it stomps towards you, while making sounds that sound like someone is smashing all of the keys at once. And it's actually impossible to kill this thing, despite the official Nintendo Power Players Guide stating that it was possible. That was a lie, maybe it was a typo, or maybe it was meant to instill false security. Who knows, perhaps it was the latter because the developers had the nerve to place a red coin right behind this thing. Thankfully the killer piano only appeared in Super Mario 64 and its DS remake. While it did make cameos in both Mario Party 2 and Mario Party 8, it was luckily detained behind the invisible walls of the game boards. Dead Hand from Ocarina of Time Unlike the Mario series, The Legend of Zelda is a bit more... realistic. Well, as realistic as a Nintendo game can be. Having said that, scary moments were a bit more commonplace in the series by the time that Ocarina of Time was released, such as the Wall Masters from A Link to the Past. However, no amount of creepy, pixelated hands could prepare you for this disgusting mess of polygons. In the second half of the game, Link must venture through the sewer system beneath Kakariko Village. This sewer system is full of corpses and enormous spiders, which really gets even worse when you realize that the entire town has been drinking corpse water this entire time. And that's just gross. But anyways, towards the end of this mini dungeon, you enter a small room with what appears to be long, bloody, pale arms sticking out of the ground. Getting too close to investigate, causes them to grab you by the head, revealing the horrifying Dead Hand to rise from the ground. Dead Hand is hands down, no pun intended, one of the most disturbing enemies in the entire Zelda series. It appears to be a mass of flabby flesh covered in patches of dried blood, slowly crawling towards you as its horrendously long hands, complete with overgrown red fingernails, pins you down so it can gnaw at you with its gaping large mouth. Eventually, Link is able to overcome the abomination and gains the Lens of Truth. However, even after it's killed, its body doesn't disappear like most other enemies in the game. Instead, its body just lies there, convulsing as if rigor mortis is setting in. It's insane how much they went out of their way to make this enemy so goddamn horrifying. It appears that Dead Hand was somewhat censored in the 3DS remake, having less bloody patches on its body. However, now it just looks like a big blob of flabby skin. You either need to go all the way with this guy, or not at all. There's no in-between for Dead Hand. Zero Two from Kirby 64 Despite its cute and cuddly exterior, the Kirby series has some seriously fucked up enemies. From Mark Soul and Kirby Superstar to Star Dream and Kirby Planet Robobot, 
It seems they try to outdo themselves in every game by having the most unexpectedly terrifying final bosses to appear in a game about a cute pink marshmallow. Today, however, we'll be looking at perhaps the most well-known final boss in the Kirby series, and possibly the creepiest. Zero first appeared in the Super Nintendo title Kirby's Dream Land 3 as the true final boss. Virtually nothing was known about him at the time, other than the fact he was the creator of Dark Matter, the final boss of Kirby's Dream Land 2. He is destroyed at the end of the game, likely never to be seen again. Except he is seen again, in the form of Zero 2, the final boss of Kirby 64, the Crystal Shards. It's unknown how exactly Zero was reincarnated, but two things are certain, he's back and he's pissed. Taking on the appearance of a fallen angel, complete with a halo and red wings, Zero Two actually cries blood in his concept art, and small splotches of what appears to be blood come out of his eye every time he gets hit. With this first and only appearance of blood in Kirby game, it definitely makes the impact it was looking for. After his defeat, Zero Two and the Dark Matter deteriorate into nothing, and are finally vanquished for good. However, Dark Matter recently started seeping back into games in Planet Robobot. Perhaps Zero will return as Zero Three someday? The Zombies from Conker's Bad Fur Day While not exactly what you'd call a kid's game, Conker's Bad Fur Day is still not the kind of game where you'd expect to be legitimately scared. It's a mostly raunchy and comedic adventure taking jabs at Rare's usual cutesy game worlds as seen in Banjo-Kazooie and Donkey Kong 64, complete with googly eyes on damn near everything. However, things get a little spooky whenever you enter the aptly named Spooky chapter. In this chapter, Conker travels to his great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, Count Batula's mansion. An angry village mob soon arrives at the front door, revealing that Count Batula is a vampire. Shocker. Conker and Batula team up and put the villagers into a grinder, killing them and feeding their blood directly to the Count. Eventually, the Count becomes so overweight and ends up falling into the grinder himself, killing him. Afterwards, Conker's left alone in the mansion when suddenly, the dead rise to attack. These zombies are presumably the remains of the villagers from earlier in the night, and are actually quite frightening. They have unpleasant gurgling moaning noises and feature bloody and decaying flesh all over their bodies. In addition to a rotting eyeball hanging from their eye socket, soon enough the mansion is full of them and the only way out is through them. Like many zombies throughout different forms of media, these zombies can only be killed with a shot to the head. The gameplay switches to a third-person shooter for this segment, completing the whole Resident Evil feeling this chapter oozes. Again, while not a children's game, let's not pretend like we all didn't play it, or at least try to play this game when we were younger. I guess this level put us back in our places, running back to our Super Mario 64s and Banjo-Kazooies. Although they had their fair share of scares too, so it looks like nowhere is safe. The Moon, from Majora's Mask. Honestly, we could fill this entire list of entries just from The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. The game has no shortage of absolutely horrifying characters, from the Skull Kid to the Happy Mask Salesman to Majora's Mask himself. But for now, we're going to be looking at the one character who is with you for your entire journey, the constant reminder that looms over your head to make sure you know that time is running out and that everyone you know will soon be dead. The moon from Majora's Mask makes sure you feel rushed and panic every time you look up at the sky, as it gets closer and closer with each passing day. Visible from just about every outdoor area in the game, the moon slowly creeps down towards Termina until the third and final day, where it makes its impact with the ground and kills everyone. Furthermore, the moon has a constant look of pure anger as it stares down at you. 
it's not clear if this is the actual moon from the sky or an original creation made by Majora's Mask. It is rather strange how small it is compared to the actual moon in the other Zelda games, but this could be explained by Termina being in a different dimension from Hyrule. There is no mention of Zelda or the Triforce in Termina after all. Towards the beginning of the game, a gem falls from the moon, called the Moon's Tear. Did this thing cry? Could it be possible that the moon doesn't want this? Is it being forced down to the ground against its will? Is it even sentient? These are all questions that have no answers, and perhaps it's best that they remain unanswered. Despite its obviously rocky exterior, the final area of the game takes place on the surface of the moon, depicted as a sunny meadow with a single large tree in the middle. Butterflies float about as four masked children run around the tree, with a lone child wearing the Majora's Mask sitting underneath the tree. The moon is truly an enigma in the world of Termina. Early screenshots of the game show a faceless moon, with the ugly face we come to fear being added in later. Well, it certainly made those three days feel a whole lot shorter, so I guess the face did its job. Let's be thankful that the moon doesn't have a face like this in the other Zelda games, or in real life for that matter. 